It's always a challenge for me because I spend about a week, uh, usually on Sunday after church, I go home and I think a little bit about what I said that Sunday, but pretty quickly my brain starts turning towards the next Sunday. And part of my process, all week long, I'm reading the text and I'm meditating and I'm contemplating and I'm pondering and I'm situating these texts in my life's experience. So the text is talking to me over here. My work experience is talking to me over here. And I am trying all week long to draw something out of this engagement of text and experience that I can share with you in the hope that you will be encouraged as you live your lives. I want you to know that the church is not about a people being passive in front of a minister. The church is a team. And one of the things I like about being here is that you are such a fine team. Everybody contributes something to make our experience of worship pleasant and edifying. That is, it builds us up. One of the delights this morning was to just wander downstairs while I was pacing off nervous energy and see a whole group of folks there with a tiny little baby, and they're getting cookie and coffee ready. And I thought, oh, that's a good thing. But this week, my thoughts were a little bit about my childhood, and my infancy. I was born in Friesland, which is in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, one thing I always like to do in church when a baby makes that sound in the middle of a sermon is I always like to stop and say, shh. A lot of folks think that that's an interruption. It's not. That's why we're here, right? This little girl, this little child, we're here as people working to make the future a healthy, happy place for such critters. But I was born in a small village, and I was conceived out of wedlock. So I had a reputation even before I came into the world. I was that little boy who was born to that couple who had committed that sin. And in the church that I grew up, mom and dad actually had to go and stand in front of the elders and admit that they had committed a sin, and they had to repent, and they had to change their ways. That's how I began my life in the church. It was serious business. Now, as a little boy, I didn't understand all of that, but it did get into me because we as adults, how we live our lives has an influence on the children all around us. And we may say things to them, and we may do things, but by a very early age, they're already able to recognize if what we say and what we do agrees. But my life was shaped by this infancy because I was loved by the village in which I was born, even though I was that little boy who was born out of wedlock. My grandparents loved me. My mom and dad loved me. The neighbors loved me. I was actually, by the time I was a year and a half, very talkative, and I loved to walk around the village, and people would enjoy chatting with the little boy. One of the problems of being a cute little boy was that every once in a while, mom would take me to tea to somebody's home, and when we got home, she discovered that I had put a teaspoon in my pocket or maybe a hanky. I was a bit of a kleptomaniac. And mother always made me go back and apologize and give the thing back. And the people would say, oh, that's okay. He's such a cute little boy. <laughs> but shortly after I was born, by the time I was about a year and a half, my family, after the war in Holland, decided to come to Canada, as many Dutch families did. And that journey changed my life in a very big way. Because I was born into this warm, loving accepting place. Then we got on this big boat. We sailed across a very stormy Atlantic Ocean, and we came to a country that I knew nothing about. Neither did my mom and dad or all the other Dutch folk on the boat. We couldn't speak the language when we got here. We couldn't understand the customs. And as a little boy, that shifted me. And from that point on, I had lived Earlier, I had lived at the center of attention. Arriving in Canada, I stepped back and I became an observer. I lived most of my young life not directly involved with what was going on around me, but watching it. I can remember in grade school, elementary school, the kids would be playing and I'd be hanging around under a tree or by the fence just watching. And looking back, I know that all along the way, I was trying to figure out what's going on 
How do I belong here? How can I be accepted? Now, I want to uh, reflect on that story a little bit because when the scriptures that we read today talk about a prophet raised up to speak to a people, I'd like you to know that prophets are shaped by their life experience exactly as every other person is. Some of you may have a gift for cooking. I imagine that if you trace that back down your family genealogy, you would find somewhere an influence that had inspired you to make good food for people. Each one of us, in a very early stage of our life, was given a gift by God, or a disposition, or an inclination. And our challenge is to get in touch with it. Well, my gift, as I see it now at the age of 67, was a prophetic gift. Having spent most of my youth, most of my young adult years, standing back and watching, I discovered something about our culture, about our civilization, that people who were most directly involved in it didn't have time to notice. They were busy going to work. They were busy paying bills. They were busy getting the kinds of things that successful people got. I was wandering around wondering, what's it all about? And at a certain age, God called me to the church so that I could begin to share my insights. Now, the texts today are about God noticing the world, world, noticing the way it's going, and selecting a person to speak to the world so that the world has hope of remedy, has hope of healing. I want you to know that God never speaks to accuse or condemn people. We may do that to one another. We may think we're doing God's will by judging and accusing other people. But God does not. The scripture says that God is a lot like that sunshine. It shines and it shines on everybody. Not everybody appreciates it. Not everybody values it. But it's there for everyone. And it's exactly the same way with God's love. Now, the text that I also thought was important for this morning in light of God using people to speak in the hope of healing was the text about Elijah going up into the mountain. And Elijah has an experience with God. And that experience gives us an opportunity to discover something about how we can be in a good relationship with God. Elijah hears the voice of a flood. He hears the voice of a wind. He hears the voice of an earthquake. He hears this great and dramatic stuff coming at him from various directions. And we may think that if God's going to speak to us, it's going to be dramatic. It's going to be important. But the last thing that Elijah experiences on that mountain that day is what one translation calls the still, small voice of God. And I think that that text is key to our understanding of how to move forward confidently with God. And one of the steps that we can take is to not be looking way out there for God. God's not in... Oh, I was going to say some politician's name, but I'm not going to do it because I don't want to start a quarrel. (laughs) God's not in all this stuff that we see in the media, all this stuff that distracts us, confuses us, frightens us, intimidates us, makes us feel nervous about the future. God's not in that. God's in the still, small voice. And each person, each one of us, has opportunity to withdraw from the busy, hurried pace of the world on a regular basis, to go into a quiet place, maybe to open a book, maybe to light a candle, maybe to burn a little bit of incense, maybe to have a jar of fresh flowers, to sit quietly for a small portion of your day and listen to that still, small voice that is speaking within you. And that's simply the voice of love, 
the love of God, the love that shaped you while you were in the womb, the love that accompanied you while you were a child, the love that guides you as an adult. And as you get in touch with this love of God that is deep inside you, your life is changed. And you become a person who now has the ability to affect others with health and happiness. Because your contact with God, your communication with God changes you. All of a sudden, you're not nearly so worried about the fact that some bozo may push a button and blow the whole earth to kingdom come. That doesn't bother you anymore because you know that God is beyond death. God is beyond the end of the world. God is everlasting. God was there in the beginning. God will be there in the future. God is here now. The last text I'd like to say a few words about is when Jesus goes into the synagogue. And what that means is that Jesus got up like the preacher or the teacher and talked to the people. And what they liked about Jesus, it says in the text, is that he spoke with somebody who had authority. In other words, he spoke as if, yes, this is worth listening to. And that's an important thing for us to catch because there were lots of religious leaders in Jerusalem at the time. There was lots of religious stuff going on in the countryside. But the people weren't hearing it anymore. They weren't getting it anymore because it had become changed. It was no longer about the still, small voice of God inside of every person. It now became about the temple and the budget for the temple. It now became about the armies. It became about all this big stuff. And Jesus was respected, admired, and revered simply because the word that he spoke helped people see the world in a new way. And everything that had them in fear, everything that had them in doubt, everything that had them in anxiety was pushed aside. Exactly like the sun when it rises in the east on a winter morning, illuminates our experience, casts out the darkness of the night. That's what getting in touch with the love of God within you is like. And I'd like to end by saying that our experience with God does not need to be complicated in any way. The only thing we really need to do is discover who it is we truly are and live that to the best of our ability. And I have a friend, and I have mentioned him before, Gil McKenzie, he's a United Church minister. He was 90-something when he said this, that the whole message is, for goodness sakes, be kind to one another. Once you recognize that you are loved by God, and once you carry that love out into the world, you will become, like Jesus, an agent of change, an agent of healing, an agent of redemption, an agent of new possibility. And again, I want to emphasize, this is not because you're going to become a great, big, famous person who's talking to the world on the media. It's because... You're going to be letting your little light shine in your little corner in such a way that other persons will be comforted simply because you've walked into the room and you shared a little bit of your life with them. So I want to encourage you not just to be worshipers or admirers of Jesus, but let Jesus get inside you and let Jesus start living through you and let your life become light in our dark world. And I'll say amen at that point.